All right, so welcome back. Thank you all for sticking around with us uh, through the little break. Uh, we're going to continue our series in um, struggle, strife, and life. And we, we've talked about what is what is suffering, right? What is it? Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things that takes on different forms. And the last time we talked about what is it, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul lays out some things for us. There were some things that, that, that he went through that was just common to man, certain things that he went through um, because he was uh, a servant of Christ, really. It was for Christ. <clears throat> and then the, the third thing was is he, he, was willing to, he was willing to spend and be spent uh, for the folks in Corinth and we we looked at some other things too and we looked at how Satan attacks the message how he attacks the messenger and then he'll try to discredit or discourage the messenger and one of the things we've talked about is there's three different types of suffering uh, that can be found in scripture one is just those that are common to man uh, those that are, are 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 come about that they come about because we just make bad decisions right and the third one is um, Things that we suffer for Christ's sake, and that's the issue, right? So that's that's the ones that we really want to talk about because, you know, the the ones that we do because we make bad decisions, and the ones that we have just for for because of life, those those don't really have any weight or anything like that uh, in glory. And it's one of those things that I do want to mention again, right off the top of the bat, that. Just because we suffer for Christ doesn't mean that we get some extra blessing, right? As far as, uh, you know, some folks teach that if you suffer for Christ, the sonship edification thing, if you suffer for Christ's sake, then you become an heir or a joint heir with Christ. That's just not true. Uh, you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ the moment that you get saved. And so where we've started off in most all of, all of them is in Philippians chapter 1. So let's turn to Philippians chapter 1. And what I want us to do is to see there are some things that we have here. Uh, and then what we're going to do is take, go take a look at Paul. All right? And we know that Paul is our pattern. And we know that we look to him um, because we know that Paul followed Christ. And he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And what we can do is we can take a look at how the Word of God worked and, and, and lived through Jesus Christ. But we can also do the exact same thing with Paul. And it's really fascinating um, to be able to see that. But notice, let's, let's take a look at uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. Alright, verse 28. 
and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which He saw in me, and now here to be in me. Father, we thank You for the opportunity that we have to study Your Word. And as we take a look at this important doctrine of suffering, uh, may we be mindful of the fact that there is consolation on the other side of this. And that's the, that's, that's the next section that we're going to talk about. And so hopefully we don't get bogged down with the suffering. Um, but we also take heart that we know that there is consolation on this other side of this doctrine. And as we prepare to get to that, uh, may we always be mindful that... Uh, that this is a privilege that we get to be a part of. And we know that it's something that, that, that we are guaranteed that this is part of our life. And um, it's, it's hard sometimes to look and say that we're going to be joyful and rejoice and all that. But we know that we can. And that's the important part. Through your word working in and through us, we thank you for the life that you've given us in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So, as we've said before, and I'm not really gone through this yet, but let's take a look at this real quick. Uh, let's just run some verses here in Philippians, because I want you all to see, you know, as we're going through that prayer, and one of the things that I was talking about there was knowing that there's consolation, and that's what we joy in. Notice in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, we just want to go through some verses real quick. 1 verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. Uh, look at chapter 1 verse 25. Notice <clears throat> chapter 1 verse 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, uh, with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith. Notice in verse 26, That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Um, go over to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. He says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, chapter 2, verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I notice, notice I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye, ye joy and rejoice with me. All right? Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And then the last one, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown of rejoicing and my crown, so stand fast, uh, so stand fast, in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So we see that word joy, rejoicing, rejoice. Every chapter in the book of Philippians. Which kind of makes you think, well how is that possible? <laughs> because you look at the things that they're, that they're going through. The folks in Philippi and also the folks in Thessalonica. The things that they were going through. By the way, I want you to notice something. Do you know the two churches that Paul deals with the most with suffering is those two churches? Have you ever thought about why? In Scripture, what do we find out about the church at Philippi and the church at Thessalonica? Because those two are the model churches. They're doing the things the right way. And what happens to them? Suffering's coming. And they both learn how to joy and rejoice. He doesn't, he doesn't talk to the, to the Corinthians about that stuff. Now, he talks to them about the stuff that he's going through and all that, and we'll take a look at that. Um, the Ephesians, is, you know, you take a look at all those things, but it's really fascinating to me that the folks in Philippi and the folks in Thessalonica, he's saying, man, you all have got it. And that's why you're going through these things. And it's really, really under, uh, interesting to me. So having this idea of being able to rejoice in suffering. That's where that consolation is going to come from, right? And that's one of those things that's tough to do. But we'll, we'll take a look at how that works. But let's first take a look at Paul. So go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Get, uh, get 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in one hand. And let's go back to uh, Acts chapter 14. 
All right. So, Second Corinthians chapter twelve in one hand, and Acts chapter fourteen. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's just spent some time, and in fact, if you go back to chapter 11, now you all remember the little chart that's not really a chart, but I'm trying to think of a way to make it a chart that we did last time. Notice in chapter 11, notice in chapter 11, verse 24, Paul starts off and says, here's some of the things that I went through, right? So chapter 11, verse 24, he says, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. So think about that. Five different times he received 39 stripes. That's 139 stripes. Or 195. I don't know why I said it. 195 stripes. Because if he did 40, that'd be 200, right? And it was save one each time. So he was he he was hit 39 times, five different times. That's 195 stripes. And again, I hate to always say this, but then we get upset if somebody doesn't like a, a, a post on Facebook. Mm-hmm. That's real suffering. And by the way, it follows this pattern. Here you've got... Uh, verse 25, Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I, su- I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. That right there is the suffering that he had for Christ. Remember we talked about that, the, the, the issues there. Verse 26, In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils in, among false brethren. Those are those things in Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4 that were common to folks. And then verse 27, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm feeling it right now. Verse 27, In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. That's the, that's the thing in 2 Corinthians 6, 5 where he's talking about being spent. Like he's willing to spend and be spent for them. That's those things there. So we see those things that we talked about last week. He gives us the list and says, here it is. Here's the things that I've suffered for Christ. Here's the things that I'm going through because it's just common to man. And then that third one is because I'm willing to spend and be spent. And so then what happens? Chapter 12, right? Verse 1. I don't know what time I started, but... So I don't know what time to end. So I'll end when I'm finished. Chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Notice he says, I will come to revelations or visions and revelations of the Lord. Notice, he knows that he's not gotten all the information yet. Notice verse uh, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Alright, so here's the thing. What people do is they'll come along and say, well... Paul just says, I knew a man. Um, so they're saying, well, this is John John, who wrote the book of John, or the, the book of Revelation. All right, so they're saying, he knew John, and, and notice, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. By the way, that always confused me. That, that, that little part in that passage, that verse always confused me. What do you mean, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell? Do you know why? Your soul looks just like your body. And I couldn't tell if I was talking to you or your soul, whether it was your body or not. God knows, though. And I thought, you know, that right there fixes it. Right there it is. <laughs> he couldn't tell the difference between whether it was in the body or whether it was in the spirit. That's a, to me, that's amazing. But notice he says, Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, question. If that was John who wrote the book of Revelation, where was it that John was when he received this revelation? The island of Patmos. 
Paul doesn't say, I knew a man that was in the island of Patmos. He says, I knew a man in heaven, right? Who was caught up to the third heaven, who was caught up into paradise. So what's that tell us where paradise is? Third heaven. Fixes that one, right? But notice, and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. So that's one of the reasons why people say, well, that's not Paul, that was John. Well, let's go take a look at this real quick. I told you all to go get Acts chapter 14, right? So Acts chapter 14. <laughs> okay. Thank you, producer. <laughs> Acts chapter 14, verse 20. So this is where Paul... In fact, let's start off in verse 19. <clears throat> this is... Paul goes into Lystra, and as his manner was, he would go in and preach in the synagogues and all that. But notice, verse 19, he says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. So what we have here is what? Paul is stoned to death. They drag him out of the city, and what do the disciples do? They stand around him, and they probably prayed, right? So then you think, Paul dies right there. He was dead. What does he do? He goes to the third heaven. That's, that's who he's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. About he knew a guy, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, who went to the third heaven, who went to the paradise, who was caught up to paradise. And that's why we said in the last section, why is it that Paul says, I would rather depart and go be with Christ, which is far better. How would he know? He was there. He knew what he was missing out on. No, and he doesn't. Notice he doesn't talk about a language, right? He says there's words that are not lawful for a man to utter. It's the revelation of the mystery. It's part of the revelation of the mystery. <laughs> and that's why that's why I said, you know, you take a look at this and you mess with it the way most people mess with it, and you you lose those things. But there was one of my as they talk about in school, aha moments, right? You, but that's fine. You're fine. But notice... Oh, no, you're fine. But notice, notice here in verse 20, it says, How be it as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came to the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. What's he do? He gets up and he goes on into Derby and he starts preaching the gospel. And we see that. In verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch, uh, confirming the, the, the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through a much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Um, and when they had ordained them elders in every, every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended themselves or commended them to the Lord of, on whom they believed. So you get a good uh, a good picture of what Paul does there with uh, the local assembly. What's their job? Evangelize, edify, confirm, exhort, ordain, and then commend. There you go. That's the pattern. So we see Paul dies back there in Acts chapter 14. Right? What's one of the things that we know about? When was the first book? What, let's do it this way. Remember doing this, right? We went through Paul and Acts, right? What was the very first book that Paul wrote? Do we remember? Starts with a G, ends in Galatians. Galatians. <laughs> Galatians, right? So the first book that Paul wrote was in Galatians. Was Galatians. When did he write it? Do we remember when he wrote it? You could refer to your notes, but... What was the one single event that we remember that we talked about that the reason why he had to have written it first is because of a particular doctrine that was being sent around. And what was the one main thing in the book of Acts that we said he had to have written it after this? Do we remember what that, that issue was? Yeah, it was uh, 
Well, when he went up to Jerusalem, right? In Acts chapter 15. That, that, that conference that they had up in... So you had the folks there at, in, in Galatia saying, if you're not circumcised after the manner of Moses, then you're not saved. Trying to keep them under the law. Yeah. And so then Paul has to write Galatians right after that to make sure that he nips that in the bud, right? Says, I've got to get this done. So, question. Acts 15 comes after Acts 14, right? Okay. What else do we know in, in Galatians chapter 1? Paul says what? <clears throat> he's, he's talking about his gospel that he neither received of man, neither was he taught it, Right? It wasn't after man, he didn't receive it of man, neither was he taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. So, you know, what were the unspeakable things? Paul hadn't written any of his epistles yet in, in Acts chapter 14. Right? So you have all these unspeakable things that he's not written yet, and when he comes back, what's, he's, what's he do shortly after that? Starts writing. It's pretty neat to me. I think that's 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 more than fascinating. I don't know if there's a word that 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 would cover what more than fascinating, but that's more than fascinating to me. Uh, but it's it's just one of those things that you know you get back you get back over in Second Corinthians chapter twelve, and you know Delilah, you pointed out earlier in in Second Corinthians chapter twelve verse four where he talks about he he knows uh, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words. A lot of people do, what they'll do is they'll say, no, that's just some heavenly language that no one could understand. Um, you got to think, it would be unlawful for somebody to tell you that you don't have to be circumcised at that time, right? Wouldn't it be unlawful for somebody to, to utter, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go to the nation of Israel. Wouldn't that have been unlawful for them? So there's the words, right? What is it? It's part of that revelation of the mystery that was given to and through the Apostle Paul. So we see those things, and you know, it's a wonderful thing to see. And uh, you know, a lot of those things are really cleared up with right division. Uh, but we'll continue on down. Notice in verse five, he says, "Of such an one will I glory; yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities." For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any should think of me above that which he seemeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Now what people will do is they'll take these verses here and say, See, you all shouldn't put Paul up on a pedestal. We've never put Paul up on a pedestal. Never done that. We put his office up, just like he put his office up, just like God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and God the Son did. He magnified his office, right? Notice in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, so those are those unspeakable words at that particular time, the, the visions and revelations that he's going to come to, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations. I want you to think about that real quick. Pause for just a second. Notice he says, and lest I should be exalted above measure. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that maybe there's a measure he's supposed to be exalted to, but we're not to exalt him above a measure? Have you ever thought about that I mean, verse? He's an important character. He's, a, he's very important. In this situation. He is to the grace message yeah. that Moses was to the law. And so, have you ever thought that he shouldn't be uh, exalted above measure, but he should be exalted to some measure? Yeah. No, no. So you think about those things. There is there there is something to do with him. We're not we're not putting him up on a pedestal. It's his position that's exalted, right? And that's what he's dealing with there. But what what happened? Lest he should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Notice, he tells us what the thorn in the flesh is. An eye problem. Is that what it says? No. Now, um, what's he say? A thorn in the flesh, what? 
the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. <clears throat> so I want to take a look at that real quick. What is the thorn in the flesh? Like I've said, everybody's got their, their ideas about it. Um, some of them are, you know, it is what it is. But let's take a look at what Scripture <clears throat> tells us. So go back to Numbers real quick. You know, it's weird. <clears throat> I've taught this for years, what we're getting ready to talk about. <clears throat> and I've had very few people that's, that's ever really agreed with me. And then a few weeks ago, um, I was watching one of <clears throat> was it David Reed's videos, the question and answers. They were like, what's the thorn in the flesh? And uh, he was like, well, it could be this. And he said the things that I've said for 20-something years. <clears throat> <clears throat> so it's really interesting. But anyway, not that I feel like, hey, I feel... Huh? Well, let's do it. Numbers Numbers chapter 33. Now I want you all to see these, 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 see these things as we go through. Um, I said Numbers 33, right? Um, let me double check something real quick. So Numbers 33, we're going to take a look at that one. But I want to... I wanted to double check one one other one real quick. Okay, Numbers 33. <clears throat> Numbers 33, notice in verse 53. So this is this is this is dealing with the law of possession of the land with the nation of Israel. Okay, so verse 53. Let's start off in verse 52. Uh, then you shall... Start off in 51. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then shall ye drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite... Uh, quite pluck down all their high places. Do you know what he's saying? When you go into Canaan, I want you to take all their religious junk and get rid of it. Now, there's a series that I'm wanting to do one day called Kicking Out the Relics. Which I need to write that down. Kicking Out the Relics, where we're going to take all those, all those religious things, and I've mentioned it before, the water baptism is the equivalent of the golden calf to the nation of Israel. So one of these days, we're going to do this. I'm going to go in and we're, I want to destroy all their pictures and their molten images and quite down, pluck down all their high places. All the things that, that, that the church out here exalts, let's kick it out. Because if you kick it out, then what are you left with? The book. Which is pretty much what we got here. Which is what we have here. Alright. I wish, but no. <laughs> No, I don't want to go to prison yet for that. I want to go to prison for preaching the gospel, not for yeah, but not for. I don't want to do it for destruction of property. All right, verse fifty-three. Notice, and ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein. What's he say? Come in, get all the religious stuff out, kick them out, and live in the land. For I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and to, and the more, and to the more ye shall uh, give the more inheritance, and to the fewer shall give less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of the fathers ye shall inherit. Notice, verse fifty-five. <clears throat> but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, what, what's he saying? Drive them out, and if you don't, notice. Then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be what? Pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. What's he saying there? You go into the city, you kick all their religious stuff out, you kick all the people out, and if you don't, what are they going to be to them? A thorn in the flesh. And what's that thorn in the flesh going to do? Going to vex them in the land where you need to dwell. Do you know what they're going to do? you know what this is? Do you know what Romans 16, 17, and 18 is? What Bruce brought up this morning? What's that? That's that verse right there. Kick them out, and if you don't, 
don't be upset if they come and, and destroy you and try to destroy your ministry. And try to kill you in Paul's case. So that's the struggle that we that we see there. And this was the person that was doing this. Uh, there there were people that were doing this to Paul all over again. Uh, go to Joshua, <clears throat> Joshua chapter twenty three. <clears throat> there was another one I thought of, but. Uh, Joshua 23, verse 12. It feels weird doing this not live. Um, I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> verse 12. Uh, let's start off in let's start off in verse 6. All right. So Joshua 23, verse 6. Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Do you think, do you, never mind, I won't do that. That ye turn not aside therein to the right hand or to the left. That ye come not among these nations. These that remain among you neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand for the Lord your God. He is it that fighteth for you, and he hath promised you, as he hath promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Else... If ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations. All right, again, God came in and threw all that stuff out. And He says, if you go back and cleave unto any of those things of the remnant of these nations. Notice, even these that remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you. Notice, Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be what? Snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorn in your eyes, until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. So what do we see here? Who, are, who is it that's the thorn, their thorn in their eyes and the scourges in their sides? Who is it? There are people that are against them, right? It's these other nations. What do we know about nations in the Old Testament Scripture? Who's that referring to? The Gentiles at that time, right? So people are messengers of Satan and they don't even know it? Yeah. Because they're following the course of the world. Because they're following the course of the world. Yep. Do what? Yeah. Um... Uh, get Judges chapter 2. <clears throat> Judges chapter 2, verse 1. So we, we're, we're coming up here. You've got the, the death of Joshua coming up in this, in this chapter. Um, you've got the, 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 the invasion of, of, of Canaan here. Notice, verse 1, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bosham and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Which ye, uh, why have ye done this? It's a good question, right? You're going into this land that I gave you. I told you to tear down their altars and you didn't. Why didn't you do it? It's a really good question. Verse 3. 
Wherefore, because of this, I also said I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be what? As thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words on all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept. God is giving them an opportunity to what? You get to make a choice. Are you going to do what I ask you to there or not? <clears throat> and what did these people end up becoming for them? He says right there, thorns in your sides and shall be what? A snare unto you. Um, last one. Go get Ezekiel chapter 28. <clears throat> this one, <clears throat> this is this is one of those. I think it's interesting. I think I think the the last two, Joshua and, and Judges, those are going to go together. So he tells us exactly what they are. The people there, you left them, you allowed them to be part of part of what you're doing. Um, now, of course, that's going to be a different application for Paul. But what is it that's 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 he that he's dealing with there is what there are people that are following the course of the world, and what the people that are following the course of the world are going to do is do what. They're going to do what? They're going to try to destroy the message, destroy the messenger, or discredit or discourage you as the messenger. And so, what's this guy do? I mean, was he, first of all, was that messenger, um, did he accomplish what he wanted to accomplish? <laughs> With Paul. With Paul. Yeah. Paul at the end of his life says, all that are in Asia have turned from me. Notice here in Ezekiel 28, uh, verse 20. Again, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... By the way, um, you all should remember, who is it that we're talking about in the context here of chapter 28? You remember when we were going through uh, the gap theory and going through or the gap principle and we were talking about that. Remember chapter 28, who are we dealing with in verse 13 is Satan. Right? It says, Thou hast been in the Garden of Eden. And so then, um, you get down to verse 18. He's talking about, By thy tra by the in iniquity of thy traffic. And, and you go on down through there. And then you see this judgment and starting off in verse 20. Notice, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Zidon and prophesy against it. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Zidon. And I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall have executed judgments in her, and she shall and, and, and shall be sanctified in her. For I will send unto her pestilence and blood into her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon, uh, upon her on every side, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Notice in verse 24, And there shall be no more a pricking briar unto the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them that despise them, and they shall know that I am the Lord God. And he goes on down talking about the future gathering of the nation of Israel. There's going to be a time where they're no longer going to have those thorns in the flesh, and God's going to get rid of them all. And He's going to regather the nation of Israel, go into the kingdom, and that's going to be a wonderful, glorious time. So when we go back over here to Second Timothy or Second Corinthians chapter twelve, when Paul's talking about this, and we've mentioned this before, you can't just study Paul's epistles. You have to study the rest of it. Paul makes references to things in the Old Testament so often that if you don't know those things, you're not going to understand what he's talking about. Now, a lot of people get caught up and say, well, if Paul quotes Old Testament Scriptures, then that means it's not for us. It was for the Gentiles at His first coming and all that junk. Yeah, well. 
So you read these things, and notice when we get back over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So when you take a look at that, there were people that were going around following Paul when Paul would go in and preach the gospel. Remember, we looked at it in Acts 14. Preach the gospel, edify them, uh, confirm them, you know, um, exhort them, go and, and, and create and, and set up elders and confirm and all that stuff, right? So then you would have people that come along and try to destroy everything that you did. Uh, one of the real quick ways that we see it, go over to Galatians. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 6. This is one that we all know by heart probably. Galatians 1 verse 6, he says to the folks in Galatia, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He's like, I am shocked that you are so, that, that you just moved on. Right? The verses that, the verses that we had earlier, they weren't stable. They weren't, they weren't built up, right? The ones that we had last week. I should say that. Because this is the following week, right? <laughs> I just wore the same clothes. But that's the issue. Paul was able to deal with those people who were the messenger of Satan. He was able to deal with those people because he was grounded. And then you see the results of it. Somebody comes along and says, yeah, but you need to be circumcised after the man of Moses. And the folks in Galatians are like, okay. And, and Paul sets back and says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I can't believe that you would allow God's word to be changed that quickly. What I taught you, you changed it just like that. That was, the, and, the, and then we see the result of it. And 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 what's he say? <clears throat> um, go over to chapter three, Galatians chapter three. And th I think this this really points out to us that this that this thorn in the flesh isn't some eye problem. Notice in chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. What's that next word? Who? Who? Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the spirit of the works by the, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And he goes on down through there dealing with it and says, guys, you can't do the works of the law, so quit trying to do the works of the law. But here's the issue. He says, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You know why? Paul comes in, preaches the gospel, brings him to the knowledge of the truth, and somebody comes in after he leaves, they come in, and they say, no, you need to be circumcised. And then Paul comes back around, and he says, guys, who is it that's done this? It's a who, it's a person. It's a group of people perhaps. But it's a thorn in the flesh. Has God promised that He's going to destroy all of the enemies that go against us? No. And that's the issue that we find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 8. Paul knows how God would have done with the nation of Israel where He would have come in and taken all those people out of the land for them and then said, here's the land, right? Notice in verse 8, that's why Paul's doing this. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Did he fully expect God to do that? He thought God would. 
Otherwise, he wouldn't have asked him three times. Notice in verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, I want to take a look at that grace that's sufficient next week. But I want you to notice something. Paul learned something there, right? Absolutely immediately. What is it that he learned? He learned that God's Word says what? My grace is sufficient for thee. And again, I've said this before. If we ever get the idea and understand the connection between the living Word and the written Word, when the living Word says the written Word to Paul the Apostle, Paul says, alright, let's go. I'm going to glory in this rather than, rather than wallow in self-pity and all that stuff. He says, I'm much, most gladly, therefore, I'll rather glory. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so we'll take a look at that next week. <clears throat> but that thorn in the flesh isn't some eye issue. It's not... It's not you know, people said that he, when he, when he got saved on the road to Damascus, where the scales uh, were on his eyes, and the scales were removed later on when he went to Ananias, and they say, "Well, he wasn't fully healed." Well, that's junk. Now, if you want to say he had some eye problems, then people go to Galatians and say, "You know, you see how large a letter I've written to you." I mean, you read that typed out. It's what six pages. If he wrote that, that's a long letter. That's a large letter. He's not talking about large letters. He said, you see how large a letter I've written unto you? By my own hand, by the way. Okay, if you want to say it's an eye problem, he was just stoned to death. They're probably going to throw it at your face. Not at your hands, right? So, you know, think about those things, but it's not an eye issue. It's not, it's not an eye problem from, from the scales being put on his eyes. It's not an eye problem from him getting stoned to death. That We see it very clearly, hopefully. It's, it's people. People are going to try to attack the message, attack the messenger, or discourage or discredit you. That's how Satan works. I'm, I'm convinced that that is his, his mystery of iniquity. I think it is. The mystery of iniquity is a, is a direct try to copycat what God's doing. What's God doing today? Working through His Word, through believers. How does Satan work? Through His Word, which is the world system, through non-believers. To me, it makes sense. Well, like I said, <clears throat> that was the first time I've ever heard anybody say that the thorn of the flesh was a group of people when David Reed did that. Um, possibly. Yeah. <clears throat> Alright, so. That's it for today. Questions, comments, concerns? Do what, Delilah? What do I need to say, producer? Okay. I thought you were something you wanted me to say. Okay. All right. So I want to thank you all for being here on Facebook. Those that are here, we greatly appreciate it. Um, you too. Thanks for putting up with me this long. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, Delilah gets to home, go home with me afterwards. So and deal with me the rest of the day. <laughs> but uh, thank you all. We're going to continue on the struggle, strife in life. We'll take a look at that grace because that grace that's sufficient is what gets us ready for the consolation. All right. So we'll get to, we'll get to talk about that next time. So thank you all for joining us. Till next time, grace and peace. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. As we take a look at this important information, may we rest in what your word actually says. Um, and we thank you for the life that we've been given through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.